When you're with your mates, it doesn't matter whether you've grown up a bit, got a decent job, or completely changed from the person you were when they first met you. You will always be remembered for some absolute nonsense you did a decade or a half ago, or some terrible attempt at comedy that didn't remotely land. The following wrestlers are lucky that they are memorable for other, more transcendent moments in their career. In mind, I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, and these are 10 horrendous promos, awesome wrestlers, want you to forget. Number 10. The Undertaker talks a load of complete... The Undertaker was never a great promo because, well, he didn't really need to be a great promo. He conveyed fear and intimidation through his body language alone. So it's not as if a terrible interview is going to make fans think less of him. However, his Raw 25 promo was a droning load of total bollocks. He said, addressing Steve Austin and Mick Foley, that now is the time for you to truly rest in peace. Despite using the second person, some fans under the belief that he had to be saying, I don't know, something, interpreted it as a cryptic retirement speech. This wasn't the case, he just had bugger all to say. Number 9. Cody Rhodes attempts to solve racism. Cody Rhodes has achieved more than most professional wrestlers ever will. He was instrumental in the formation of the first viable mainstream competition in almost two decades, and he proved that it was possible to play the earnest babyface in the 21st century. Oh, and he solved racism as well. He didn't, obviously, but he's become a meme for his pro-USA rah-rah speech of May 12, 2021, and while he acknowledged that it wasn't a perfect country, it was rather a lot worse than that in 2021. Wrestling simply isn't the medium to tackle subjects of such weight. With the exception of mental health, which AEW has handled with a remarkable elegance, it is best to leave everything else, I'm talking politics, religion, and supernatural law bullshit, well alone. And to his credit, he does regret cutting the thing. Number 8. The Rock's Act Gets Old Dwayne Johnson is entering a turbulent period in his career arc. After conquering Hollywood as the funny hard man, the tongue-in-cheek action hero who rescued a genre by recognizing and luxuriating in its silliness, he is kind of cycling out of fashion. He's been descending into parody for a long old time now, as was evident during his Kung Pao bitch promo ahead of WrestleMania 28. It wouldn't have been especially funny if, in full-blown charismatic hype mode, he tossed it out rapid fire, but he punctuated each word with huge drama dramatic effect, as if it was a truly grave insult and not something Brian Gewertz came up with when he was rushed for time. Number 7. Tony Storm has a complete nightmare. Tony Storm is a fantastic pro wrestler who goes sadly underappreciated by AEW fans. Her run was tainted despite Tony entering physical outstanding performances. Still though, that shiny, shiny promo, yikes. Talking about how she'd battered away all challenges to her WWE NXT UK title, she said that it came with a lot of pressure. She welcomed that, which was ironic because this is when the promo fell apart part entirely. Because I love the wild side. After filibustering through some word soup, she again tried to get the shiny shiny over as a catchphrase and dropped a Motley Crew reference saying that it's staying home sweet home before attempting, I don't know, some kind of laugh. Meant to convey that there's nothing anybody could do about it, her bratty laugh sounded like she just called her parent a bad word before scurrying away upstairs. Number 6. Roman Reigns didn't always operate in God mode. Roman Reigns is a phenomenal wrestler these days. He resonates as nothing less than a megastar of a heel. He simply feels enormous. You'll have heard about the suffering Sokotash promo for as long as Roman Reigns didn't get over as a baby phase, which is a bloody long time, but it can never go understated just how disastrous it was. Vince McMahon genuinely thought that he could get Roman over with a bit of alliteration and a cocky smile, woefully unaware that the people who slick use alliteration because they have exactly nothing of substance or interest to say are the absolute worst. Number five, Dean Ambrose 
Thank God for AEW. All Elite Wrestling is a godsend, and if that scans as bias, just go back and watch Dean Ambrose's work in late 2018. The material was objectively appalling. Cast as a man so disgusted by the vermin fans that they turned him into a germaphobe, that was Larry Zabisco turns on Bruno Sammartino grade material, though, in contrast to Ambrose telling Roman Reigns that by enduring a recurrence of leukemia, he'd answer to the man upstairs. This was truly reprehensible stuff. And the worst of it is that Ambrose, per his legendary appearance on Talk is Jericho, was actually asked to say something even worse. John Moxley is infinitely better than Dean Ambrose. John Moxley has a 99% hit rate. But about that 1%? Number four, John Moxley gets lost. The problem with Mox is that he is too honest. He couldn't be a carny even if he tried, and while that is a beyond admirable quality, he does create an issue when he's tasked with selling something he doesn't believe in or just doesn't get. As 11th hour scrambles go, the build to the Full Gear 2022 main event wasn't half bad at all. Nobody quite knew the finish nor how the MJF character would align himself afterwards. The mystery was the selling point, but when Mox attempted to unpack it on the go home show, yeah, he failed. Constitutionally unable to sift through it all, he deadpanned throughout, outwardly expressing that he wasn't really into this. And then he got the night of the event wrong with a shrug. See you all on Sunday. What's that Saturday? Number three. Tonight, the role of Reverend Lovejoy will be played by Seth Rollins. The Rollins character is strange. It should be more cringeworthy than it is. He's playing unhinged and nobody actually believes that he's not in control of his rational mind, but he's not not entertaining. It's just about silly enough to work, ultimately. But before he settled on this jester <laughs> stick, he played a solemn highest heel after the fiend, well, killed him as a baby face. The Monday Night Messiah began as a meta riff on his self-anointed locker room leader role. He was talking in thesaurus WWE speak and promising to eradicate non-compliant WWE stars for the greater good. The greater good. Aiming for Sinister, he scanned like one of those developmental saps given a poorly defined supernatural gimmick in the early noughties. Like Mordecai, but with the ability to work four stars and above matches. Number two, Edge is involved in a different sort of bloodbath. Edge, once a riot of a heel character, is altogether a bit too intense these days. Where's the guy who once ripped Ric Flair a new arsehole in one of the best impersonation angles ever? Nonetheless, Edge was awesome, and for a very long time, but it did take him a while to get over. As part of the brood, Edge banged on about some bollocks, visibly hating his life and saying things like, For those who believe will follow, and those who don't will merely exist. What? So those who don't go along with whatever the hell you're talking about are just gonna go unharmed? Some heels you are. Number one. Good job they got Paul Heyman in. Brock Lesnar is a very effective promo, providing he says very little. He is the most credible professional wrestler ever. The UFC influence build to his Extreme Rules 2012 return match with John Cena was phenomenal. Lesnar opening up a bloody hole in Cena's skull, saying in a pre-tape that he doesn't care about what is going through John Cena's mind, but what's running down his leg, piss, was magnificent. The problem is that it wasn't exclusively built like a UFC fight because WWE being bloody WWE, they had to add a contract signing in there. He dragged it out for so long and repeated himself for so often that the impossible happened. Lesnar was so uncomfortable that it became almost easy to feel sorry for him. Imagine feeling sorry for Brock Lesnar. He had demands. He had the same demands again. Seven minutes and 1,000 awkward pauses later, he had the exact same demands. Thankfully, Paul Heyman was brought in. And that's our list. Did we miss any out? Let us know in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, wherever you get your podcasts from, for daily wrestling podcasts. And you can let us know your thoughts on Twitter, at WhatCultureWWE. And you can find me on there, at Adam Wilborn. Thanks for watching. I've been Adam from What Culture, and I'll see you soon.